Number Theory, Wikipedia Article Audio Number Theory, or in older usage arithmetic, is a branch of pure mathematics devoted primarily to the study of the integers. It is sometimes called the queen of mathematics because of its foundational place in the discipline. Number theorists study prime numbers as well as the properties of objects made out of integers or defined as generalizations of the integers. History Origins Dawn of Arithmetic Classical Greece and the Early Hellenistic Period Diophantus Riabha, Brahmagupta, Pskara Arithmetic in the Islamic Golden Age Western Europe in the Middle Ages Early Modern Number Theory Fermat Euler Lagrange, Legendre, and Gauss Maturity and division into subfields Main subdivisions Elementary tools Analytic number theory Algebraic number theory Diophantin geometry Recent approaches and subfields Probabilistic number theory Arithmetic combinatorics Computations in number theory Applications Prizes Notes Integers can be considered either in themselves or as solutions to equations. Questions in number theory are often best understood through the study of analytical objects that encode properties of the integers, primes or other number theoretic objects in some fashion. One may also study real numbers in relation to rational numbers, e.g., as approximated by the latter. Sources the older term for number theory is arithmetic. By the early 20th century, it had been superseded by number theory. The use of the term arithmetic for number theory regained some ground in the second half of the 20th century, arguably in part due to French influence. In particular, arithmetical is preferred as an adjective to number theoretic. The first historical find of an arithmetical nature is a fragment of a table, the broken clay tablet Plimpton 322 contains a list of Pythagorean triples, i.e., integers, a, b, c, such that, a, 2, plus, b, 2, equals, c, 2, plus b equals c. The triples are too many and too large to have been obtained by brute force. The heading over the first column reads, the tachyltum of the diagonal which has been subtracted such that the width. The table's layout suggests that it was constructed by means of what amounts, in modern language, to the identity. Which is implicit in routine old Babylonian exercises. If some other method was used, the triples were first constructed and then reordered by C slash A, presumably for actual use as a table, i.e., with a view to applications. It is not known what these applications may have been, or whether there could have been any, Babylonian astronomy, for example, truly came into its own only later. It has been suggested instead that the table was a source of numerical examples for school problems. While Babylonian number theory or what survives of Babylonian mathematics that can be called thus consists of this single, striking fragment, Babylonian algebra was exceptionally well developed. Late Neoplatonic sources state that Pythagoras learned mathematics from the Babylonians. Much earlier sources state that Thales and Pythagoras traveled and studied in Egypt. Euclid 92134 is very probably Pythagorean, it is very simple material and even number, 
then it also measures half of it, but it is all that is needed to prove that, too, is irrational. Pythagorean mystics gave great importance to the odd and the even. The discovery that, too, is irrational is credited to the early Pythagoreans. By revealing that numbers could be irrational, this discovery seems to have provoked the first foundational crisis in mathematical history. Its proof or its divulgation are sometimes credited to Hippasus, who was expelled or split from the Pythagorean sect. This forced a distinction between numbers, on the one hand, and lengths and proportions, on the other hand. The Pythagorean tradition spoke also of so-called polygonal or figurate numbers. While square numbers, cubic numbers, etc., are seen now as more natural than triangular numbers, pentagonal numbers, etc., the study of the sums of triangular and pentagonal numbers would prove fruitful in the early modern period. We know of no clearly arithmetical material in ancient Egyptian or Vedic sources, though there is some algebra in both. The Chinese remainder theorem appears as an exercise in Sun Tzu Swan Jing. It is the problem that was later solved by Riabha S. Kweka C. Below. There is also some numerical mysticism in Chinese mathematics, but, unlike that of the Pythagoreans, it seems to have led nowhere. Like the Pythagoreans' perfect numbers, magic squares have passed from superstition into recreation. Aside from a few fragments, the mathematics of classical Greece is known to us either through the reports of contemporary non-mathematicians or through mathematical works from the early Hellenistic period. In the case of number theory, this means, by and large, Plato and Euclid, respectively. While Asian mathematics influenced Greek and Hellenistic learning, it seems to be the case that Greek mathematics is also an indigenous tradition. Eusebius, P.E.X., Chapter 4 mentions of Pythagoras. In fact the said Pythagoras, while busily studying the wisdom of each nation, visited Babylon and Egypt, and all Persia, being instructed by the Magi and the priests, and in addition to these he is related to have studied under the Brahmins, and from some he gathered astrology, from others geometry and arithmetic and music from others, and different things from different nations, and only from the wise men of Greece did he get nothing, wedded as they were to a poverty and dearth of wisdom, so. On the contrary he himself became the author of instruction to the Greeks in the learning which he had procured from abroad. Aristotle claimed that the philosophy of Plato closely followed the teachings of the Pythagoreans, and Cicero repeats this claim, Platonum ferunt didesis a Pythagorea omnia. Plato had a keen interest in mathematics, and distinguished clearly between arithmetic and calculation. It is through one of Plato's dialogues namely, Theaetetus that we know that Theodorus had proven that, 3, 5, 17, comma backslash dots, are irrational. Theaetetus was, like Plato, a disciple of Theodorus's, he worked on distinguishing different kinds of incommensurables, and was thus arguably a pioneer in the study of number systems. Euclid devoted part of his elements to prime numbers and divisibility, topics that belong unambiguously to number theory and are basic to it. In particular, he gave an algorithm for computing the greatest common divisor of two numbers and the first known proof of the infinitude of primes. In 1773, Lessing published an epigram he had found in a manuscript during his work as a librarian, it claimed to be a letter sent by Archimedes to Eratosthenes. The epigram proposed what has become known as Archimedes's cattle problem, its solution requires solving an indeterminate quadratic equation. 
As far as we know, such equations were first successfully treated by the Indian school. It is not known whether Archimedes himself had a method of solution. Very little is known about Diophantus of Alexandria, he probably lived in the 3rd century CE, that is, about 500 years after Euclid. Six out of the thirteen books of Diophantus's Arithmetica survive in the original Greek, four more books survive in an Arabic translation. The Arithmetica is a collection of worked-out problems where the task is invariably to find rational solutions to a system of polynomial equations, usually of the form, f, x, y, equals, z, 2, or, f, x, y, z, equals, w, 2. Thus, nowadays, we speak of Diophantine equations when we speak of polynomial equations to which rational or integer solutions must be found. One may say that Diophantus was studying rational points i.e., points whose coordinates are rational on curves and algebraic varieties, however, unlike the Greeks of the classical period, who did what we would now call basic algebra in geometrical terms, Diophantus did what we would now call basic algebraic geometry in purely algebraic terms. In modern language, what Diophantus did was to find rational parametrizations of varieties, that is, given an equation of the form, f, x, 1, x, 2, x, 3, equals, 0. His aim was to find three rational functions, g, 1, g, 2, g, 3, g, g, such that, for all values of, r, and, s, setting, x, i, equals, g, i, r, s, equals g, 4, i, equals, 1, 2, 3, gives a solution to f x 1 x 2 x 3 equals 0. Diophantus also studied the equations of some non-rational curves, for which no rational parametrization is possible. He managed to find some rational points on these curves by means of what amounts to a tangent construction, Translated into coordinate geometry, his method would be visualized as drawing a tangent to a curve at a known rational point, and then finding the other point of intersection of the tangent with the curve, that other point is a new rational point. While Diophantus was concerned largely with rational solutions, he assumed some results on integer numbers in particular that every integer is the sum of four squares. While Greek astronomy probably influenced Indian learning, to the point of introducing trigonometry, it seems to be the case that Indian mathematics is otherwise an indigenous tradition, in particular, there is no evidence that Euclid's elements reached India before the 18th century. Riabha showed that pairs of simultaneous congruences, n, a, 1, mod, m, 1, n, a, 2, mod, m, 2, could be solved by a method he called quaka, or pulverizer, this is a procedure close to the Euclidean algorithm, which was probably discovered independently in India. Riabha seems to have had in mind applications to astronomical calculations. Brahmagupta started the systematic study of indefinite quadratic equations in particular, the misnamed Pell equation, in which Archimedes may have first been interested, and which did not start to be solved in the West until the time of Fermat and Euler. Later Sanskrit authors would follow using Brahmagupta's technical terminology. A general procedure for solving Pell's equation was finally found by Jayadeva, the earliest surviving exposition appears in Bhaskara 2 Esp Jagata.
Indian mathematics remained largely unknown in Europe until the late 18th century, Brahmagupta and Bhaskara's work was translated into English in 1817 by Henry Colebrook. In the early 9th century, the Caliph al-Mamun ordered translations of many Greek mathematical works and at least one Sanskrit work or may not be Brahmagupta's Brahmasvay Siddhanta. Diophantus's main work, the Arithmetica, was translated into Arabic by Custa ibn Luka. Part of the treatise Al-Fakri builds on it to some extent. According to Rashid Rashdi, al karajs contemporary ibn al-Haytham knew what would later be called Wilson's theorem. Other than a treatise on squares in arithmetic progression by Fibonacci who lived and studied in North Africa and Constantinople during his formative years, ca 1175-1200 no number theory to speak of was done in Western Europe during the Middle Ages. Matters started to change in Europe in the late Renaissance, thanks to a renewed study of the works of Greek antiquity. A catalyst was the textual emendation and translation into Latin of Diophantus's Arithmetica. Fermat's little theorem, stating that, if a is not divisible by a prime p, then, a, p, 1, 1, mod, p, backslash, equivy 1, if a and b are ka prime, then, a, 2, plus, b, 2, plus b, is not divisible by any prime congruent to 1 modulo 4, and every prime congruent to 1 modulo 4 can be written in the form, a, 2, plus, b, 2, plus b. These two statements also date from 1640 in 1659. Fermat stated to Huygens that he had proven the latter statement by the method of infinite descent. Fermat and Frenicle also did some work on other quadratic forms. Fermat posed the problem of solving x 2 n y 2 equals 1 New York equals 1 as a challenge to English mathematicians. The problem was solved in a few months by Wallace and Brunecker. Fermat considered their solution valid, but pointed out they had provided an algorithm without a proof. He states that a proof can be found by descent. Fermat developed methods for finding points on curves of genus 0 and 1. As in Diophantus, there are many special procedures and what amounts to a tangent construction but no use of a secant construction, Fermat states and proves in the appendix to observations on Diophantus that, x, 4, plus, y, 4, equals, z, 4, plus y equals z, has no non-trivial solutions in the integers. Fermat also mentioned to his correspondence that, x, 3, plus, y, 3, equals, z, 3, plus y equals z, has no non-trivial solutions, and that this could be proven by descent. The first known proof is due to Euler. Proofs for Fermat's statements This includes Fermat's little theorem, the fact that, p, equals, x, 2, plus, y, 2, plus y, if and only if, p, 1, mod, 4, initial work towards a proof that every integer is the sum of four squares, soon improved by Euler himself, the lack of non-zero integer solutions to, x, 4, plus, y, 4, equals, z, 2, plus y equals z, dot, Pell's equation first misnamed by Euler. He wrote on the link between continued fractions and Pell's equation, first steps towards analytic number theory. In his work of sums of four squares, partitions, pentagonal numbers, 
and the distribution of prime numbers, Euler pioneered the use of what can be seen as analysis in number theory. Since he lived before the development of complex analysis, most of his work is restricted to the formal manipulation of power series. He did, however, do some very notable early work on what would later be called the Riemann zeta function, quadratic forms. Following Fermat's lead, Euler did further research on the question of which primes can be expressed in the form, x, 2, plus, n, y, 2, plus New York, some of it prefiguring quadratic reciprocity, Diophantin equations. Euler worked on some Diophantin equations of genus 0 and 1. In particular, he studied Diophantus's work, he tried to systematize it, but the time was not yet ripe for such an endeavor algebraic geometry was still in its infancy. He did notice there was a connection between Diophantin problems and elliptic integrals, whose study he had himself initiated. The rise to self-consciousness of number theory as a field of study, the development of much of modern mathematics necessary for basic modern number theory, complex analysis, group theory, Galois theory accompanied by greater rigor in analysis and abstraction in algebra, the rough subdivision of number theory into its modern subfields in particular, analytic and algebraic number theory. In terms of its tools, as the study of the integers by means of tools from real and complex analysis, or, in terms of its concerns, as the study within number theory of estimates on size and density, as opposed to identities. G. H. Hardy, E. M. Wright An Introduction to the Theory of Numbers Oxford University Press ISBN 978-0-19-921986-5 Retrieved March 2, 2016 Yvonne M. Niven, Herbert S. Zuckerman, Hugh L. Montgomery An Introduction to the Theory of Numbers John Wiley and Sons ISBN 978-81-265-1811-1 Retrieved 2016-02-28, Kenneth H. Rosen Elementary Number Theory Pearson Education ISBN 978-0-321-71773-0 Retrieved February 28, 2016. Borivuk, A. I., Shafarovic, Igor R. Number Theory. Pure and Applied Mathematics. 20. Boston, Ma., Academic Press. ISBN 978-0-12-117850-0. MR 0195803 Pierre de Fermat never published his writings, in particular, his work on number theory is contained almost entirely in letters to mathematicians and in private marginal notes. He wrote down nearly no proofs in number theory, he had no models in the area. He did make repeated use of mathematical induction introducing the method of infinite descent. One of Fermat's first interests was perfect numbers and amicable numbers, this led him to work on integer divisors, which were from the beginning among the subjects of the correspondence that put him in touch with the mathematical community of the day. He had already studied Bachet's edition of Diophantus carefully, by 1643, his interests had shifted largely to Diophantin problems and sums of squares. Fermat's achievements in arithmetic include Fermat's claim to have shown there are no solutions to x, n, plus, y, n, equals, 
z n plus y equals z for all n greater than or equal to 3 appears only in his annotations on the margin of his copy of Diophantus. The interest of Leonhard Euler in number theory was first spurred in 1729, when a friend of his, the amateur Goldbach, pointed him towards some of Fermat's work on the subject. This has been called the rebirth of modern number theory, after Fermat's relative lack of success in getting his contemporaries' attention for the subject. Euler's work on number theory includes the following. Joseph Louis Lagrange was the first to give full proofs of some of Fermat's and Euler's work and observations for instance, the four-square theorem and the basic theory of the misnamed Pell's equation he also studied quadratic forms in full generality was the first to state the law of quadratic reciprocity. He also conjectured what amounts to the prime number theorem and Dirichlet's theorem on arithmetic progressions. He gave a full treatment of the equation, a, x, 2, plus, b, y, 2, plus, c, z, 2, equals, 0, plus by plus c, z equals 0, and worked on quadratic forms along the lines later developed fully by Gauss. In his old age, he was the first to prove Fermat's last theorem for, n, equals, 5. In his Disquisitions Arithmetic, Carl Friedrich Gauss proved the law of quadratic reciprocity and developed the theory of quadratic forms. He also introduced some basic notation and devoted a section to computational matters, including primality tests. The last section of the Disquisitions established a link between roots of unity and number theory. The theory of the division of the circle which is treated in sector 7 does not belong by itself to arithmetic, but its principles can only be drawn from higher arithmetic. In this way, Gauss arguably made a first foray towards both Everest Galois' work and algebraic number theory. Starting early in the 19th century, the following developments gradually took place. Algebraic number theory may be said to start with the study of reciprocity and cyclotomy, but truly came into its own with the development of abstract algebra and early ideal theory and valuation theory, see below. A conventional starting point for analytic number theory is Dirichlet's theorem on arithmetic progressions, whose proof introduced L functions and involved some asymptotic analysis and a limiting process on a real variable. The first use of analytic ideas in number theory actually goes back to Euler, who used formal power series and non-rigorous limiting arguments. The use of complex analysis in number theory comes later, the work of Bernhard Riemann on the zeta function is the canonical starting point. Jacobi's four-square theorem, which predates it, belongs to an initially different strand that has by now taken a leading role in analytic number theory. The history of each subfield is briefly addressed in its own section below, see the main article of each subfield for fuller treatments. Many of the most interesting questions in each area remain open and are being actively worked on. The term elementary generally denotes a method that does not use complex analysis. For example, the prime number theorem was first proven using complex analysis in 1896, but an elementary proof was found only in 1949 by Erds and Selberg. The term is somewhat ambiguous, for example, Proofs based on complex Taubarian theorems are often seen as quite enlightening but not elementary, in spite of using Fourier analysis, rather than complex analysis as such. Here as elsewhere, an elementary proof may be longer and more difficult for most readers than a non-elementary one. 
Number theory has the reputation of being a field many of whose results can be stated to the lay person. At the same time, the proofs of these results are not particularly accessible, in part because the range of tools they use is, if anything, unusually broad within mathematics. Analytic number theory may be defined. Some subjects generally considered to be part of analytic number theory, e.g., sieve theory, are better covered by the second rather than the first definition. Some of sieve theory, for instance, uses little analysis, yet it does belong to analytic number theory. The following are examples of problems in analytic number theory the prime number theorem, the Goldbach conjecture the wearing problem and the Riemann hypothesis. Some of the most important tools of analytic number theory are the circle method, sieve methods, and L functions. The theory of modular forms also occupies an increasingly central place in the toolbox of analytic number theory. One may ask analytic questions about algebraic numbers, and use analytic means to answer such questions. It is thus that algebraic and analytic number theory intersect. For example, one may define prime ideals and ask how many prime ideals there are up to a certain size. This question can be answered by means of an examination of data kint zeta functions, which are generalizations of the Riemann zeta function, a key analytic object at the roots of the subject. This is an example of a general procedure in analytic number theory, deriving information about the distribution of a sequence from the analytic behavior of an appropriately constructed complex-valued function. An algebraic number is any complex number that is a solution to some polynomial equation, f, x, equals, zero, with rational coefficients, for example, Every solution, x, of, x, 5, plus, 11 slash, 2, x, 3, 7, x, 2, plus, 9, equals, 0, plus x7 x plus 9 equals 0, is an algebraic number. Fields of algebraic numbers are also called algebraic number fields or shortly number fields. Algebraic number theory studies algebraic number fields. Thus, analytic and algebraic number theory can and do overlap, the former is defined by its methods, the latter by its objects of study. It could be argued that the simplest kind of number fields were already studied by Gauss, as the discussion of quadratic forms and disquisitions arithmetic can be restated in terms of ideals and norms in quadratic fields. For that matter, the 11th century Chakravala method amounts in modern terms to an algorithm for finding the units of a real quadratic number field. However, neither Pskarin nor Gauss knew of number fields as such. The grounds of the subject as we know it were set in the late 19th century, when ideal numbers, the theory of ideals and valuation theory were developed, these are three complementary ways of dealing with the lack of unique factorization in algebraic number fields. All of, 2, 3, 1, plus, 5, and, 1, 5, are irreducible, and thus, in a naive sense, analogous to primes among the integers. The initial impetus for the development of ideal numbers seems to have come from the study of higher reciprocity laws, i.e., generalizations of quadratic reciprocity. Number fields are often studied as extensions of smaller number fields, a field L is said to be an extension of a field K if L contains K classifying the possible extensions of a given number field is a difficult and partially open problem. Abelian extensions that is, 
extensions L of K such that the Galois group Gal of L over K is an abelian group are relatively well understood. Their classification was the object of the program of class field theory, which was initiated in the late 19th century and carried out largely in 1900-1950. An example of an active area of research in algebraic number theory is Iwasawa theory. The Langlands program, one of the main current large-scale research plans in mathematics, is sometimes described as an attempt to generalize class field theory to non-abelian extensions of number fields. The central problem of Diophantin geometry is to determine when a Diophantin equation has solutions, and if it does, how many? The approach taken is to think of the solutions of an equation as a geometric object. For example, an equation in two variables defines a curve in the plane. More generally, an equation, or system of equations, in two or more variables defines a curve, a surface, or some other such object in n-dimensional space. In Diophantin geometry, one asks whether there are any rational points or integral points on the curve or surface. If there are any such points, the next step is to ask how many there are and how they are distributed. A basic question in this direction is, are there finitely or infinitely many rational points on a given curve? What about integer points? An example here may be helpful. Consider the Pythagorean equation, x, 2, plus, y, 2, equals, 1, plus y equals 1, we would like to study its rational solutions, i.e., its solutions, x, y, such that x and y are both rational. This is the same as asking for all integer solutions to, a 2 plus b 2 equals c 2 plus b equals c any solution to the latter equation gives us a solution x equals a slash c y equals b slash c to the former it is also the same as asking for all points with rational coordinates on the curve described by x 2 plus y 2 equals 1 plus y equals 1. The rephrasing of questions on equations in terms of points on curves turns out to be felicitous. The finiteness or not of the number of rational or integer points on an algebraic curve that is, rational or integer solutions to an equation, f, x, y, equals, 0, where, f, is a polynomial and two variables turns out to depend crucially on the genus of the curve. The genus can be defined as follows, allow the variables in, f, x, y, equals, 0, to be complex numbers, then, f, x, y, equals, 0, defines a two-dimensional surface in four-dimensional space. Count the number of holes in the surface, call this number the genus of, f, x, y, equals, zero. Other geometrical notions turn out to be just as crucial. There is also the closely linked area of Diophantin approximations, given a number, x, how well can it be approximated by rationals? Equals 1, a good approximation to, x, if, x, a slash, q, 1, q, c, where, c, is large. This question is of special interest if, x, is an algebraic number. If, x, cannot be well approximated, then some equations do not have integer or rational solutions. Moreover, 
several concepts turn out to be crucial both in Diophantine geometry and in the study of Diophantine approximations. This question is also of special interest in transcendental number theory, if a number can be better approximated than any algebraic number, then it is a transcendental number. It is by this argument that pi and e have been shown to be transcendental. Diophantine geometry should not be confused with the geometry of numbers, which is a collection of graphical methods for answering certain questions in algebraic number theory. Arithmetic geometry, on the other hand, is a contemporary term for much the same domain as that covered by the term Diophantine geometry. The term arithmetic geometry is arguably used most often when one wishes to emphasize the connections to modern algebraic geometry rather than to techniques in Diophantine approximations. The areas below date as such from no earlier than the mid-20th century, even if they are based on older material. For example, as is explained below, the matter of algorithms in number theory is very old in some sense older than the concept of proof, at the same time, the modern study of computability dates only from the 1930s and 1940s, and computational complexity theory from the 1970s. Take a number at random between 1 and a million. How likely is it to be prime? This is just another way of asking how many primes there are between 1 and a million. Further, how many prime divisors will it have, on average? How many divisors will it have altogether, and with what likelihood? What is the probability that it will have many more or many fewer divisors or prime divisors than the average? Much of probabilistic number theory can be seen as an important special case of the study of variables that are almost, but not quite mutually independent. For example, the event that a random integer between 1 and a million be divisible by 2 and the event that it be divisible by 3 are almost independent, but not quite. It is sometimes said that probabilistic combinatorics uses the fact that whatever happens with probability greater than, 0, must happen sometimes. One may say with equal justice that many applications of probabilistic number theory hinge on the fact that whatever is unusual must be rare. If certain algebraic objects can be shown to be in the tail of certain sensibly defined distributions, it follows that there must be few of them. This is a very concrete non probabilistic statement following from a probabilistic one. At times, a non rigorous, Probabilistic approach leads to a number of heuristic algorithms and open problems, notably Kramer's conjecture. Let A be a set of n integers. Consider the set A plus A equals consisting of all sums of two elements of A. Is A and A much larger than A? Barely larger? If A and A is barely larger than A, must A have plenty of arithmetic structure? For example, does A resemble an arithmetic progression? If we begin from a fairly thick infinite set, A, does it contain many elements in arithmetic progression, A, A, plus, B, A, plus, 2, B, A, plus, 3, B, A, plus, 10, B, say? Should it be possible to write large integers as sums of elements of A? These questions are characteristic of arithmetic combinatorics. This is a presently coalescing field, it subsumes additive number theory and, arguably, some of the geometry of numbers, together with some rapidly developing new material. Its focus on issues of growth and distribution accounts in part for its developing links with ergodic theory, finite group theory, model theory, and other fields. The term additive combinatorics is also used, however, 
The sets, a, being studied need not be sets of integers, but rather subsets of non-commutative groups, for which the multiplication symbol, not the addition symbol, is traditionally used, they can also be subsets of rings, in which case the growth of, a, plus, a, and, a, a, may be compared. While the word algorithm goes back only to certain readers of algorithm, careful descriptions of methods of solution are older than proofs, such methods are as old as any recognizable mathematics ancient Egyptian, Babylonian, Vedic, Chinese whereas proofs appeared only with the Greeks of the classical period. An interesting early case is that of what we now call the Euclidean algorithm. In its basic form it appears as Proposition 2 of Book 7 in Elements, together with a proof of correctness. However, in the form that is often used in number theory it first appears in the works of Riabha as an algorithm called Quaka, without a proof of correctness. There are two main questions, can we compute this? And can we compute it rapidly? Anyone can test whether a number is prime or, if it is not, split it into prime factors, doing so rapidly is another matter. We now know fast algorithms for testing primality, but, in spite of much work, no truly fast algorithm for factoring. The difficulty of a computation can be useful. Modern protocols for encrypting messages depend on functions that are known to all, but whose inverses are known only to a chosen few, and would take one too long a time to figure out on one's own. For example, these functions can be such that their inverses can be computed only if certain large integers are factorized. While many difficult computational problems outside number theory are known, most working encryption protocols nowadays are based on the difficulty of a few number theoretical problems. On a different note some things may not be computable at all, in fact, this can be proven in some instances. For instance, in 1970, it was proven, as a solution to Hilbert's tenth problem, that there is no Turing machine which can solve all Diophantin equations. In particular, this means that, given a computably enumerable set of axioms, there are Diophantin equations for which there is no proof, starting from the axioms, of whether the set of equations has or does not have integer solutions. The number theorist Leonard Dixon said thank God that number theory is unsullied by any application. Such a view is no longer applicable to number theory. In 1974, Donald Knud said, virtually every theorem in elementary number theory arises in a natural, motivated way in connection with the problem of making computers do high-speed numerical calculations. Elementary number theory is taught in discrete mathematics courses for computer scientists, on the other hand, number theory also has applications to the continuous in numerical analysis, as well as the well-known applications to cryptography, there are also applications to many other areas of mathematics. The American Mathematical Society awards the Cole Prize in number theory. Moreover number theory is one of the three mathematical sub-disciplines rewarded by the Fermat Prize. The question how was the tablet calculated? Does not have to have the same answer as the question what problems does the tablet set? The first can be answered most satisfactorily by reciprocal pairs, as first suggested half a century ago and the second by some sort of right triangle problems. Robson takes issue with the notion that the scribe who produced Plimpton 322 could have been motivated by his own idle curiosity in the absence of a market for new mathematics. Now there are an unknown number of things. If we count by threes, 
there is a remainder 2, if we count by 5s, there is a remainder 3, if we count by 7s, there is a remainder 2. Find the number of things. Answer, 23. Now there is a pregnant woman whose age is 29. If the gestation period is 9 months, determine the sex of the unborn child. Answer, male. This is the last problem in Sun's otherwise matter-of-fact treatise. Two of the most popular introductions to the subject are Hardy and Wright's book is a comprehensive classic, though its clarity sometimes suffers due to the author's insistence on elementary methods. Vinogradoff's main attraction consists in its set of problems, which quickly lead to Vinogradoff's own research interests. The text itself is very basic and close to minimal. Other popular first introductions are Popular choices for a second textbook include 